Are the allegations leveled against UNRWA driven by a larger agenda? Welcome to Connections, the Arab Studies Institute interview program. I'm Moin Rabbani, and for this episode, we're delighted to be speaking with Chris Gunnis, the award-winning journalist who served as the agency's Director of Strategic Information and Advocacy between 2007 and 2020. Chris Gunnis, it's a real pleasure to welcome you to Connections. It's a great pleasure to be with you, and thank you very much for having me on your on your show. Thank you. Um, I'd like to start with maybe a general question about UNRWA, the United Nations uh, Refugee Relief and Works Agency for Palestine Refugees in the Near East. Um, many people may ask, why is there a specialized agency for Palestinian refugees at all? And how does its mandate and definition differ from that of its larger and well-known and better known sister agency, UNHCR, the United Nations High Commission for Refugees? That's a really important question, Wayne, because it actually gets to the heart of the current problems that the UN is facing. UNRWA was voted into existence by the General Assembly in December 1949 and became operational on the ground in May 1950. This was a response to the 1948 war, which saw 750,000 Palestinians driven from their homes or they fled from their homes into neighbouring countries. So those in the north of Palestine went up into Lebanon, those in the northeast went to Syria, those in the east went to Jordan, others went to the West Bank and some to Gaza. As its name suggests, the immediate task of UNRWA in those early days was to give relief to desperate refugees who needed water, they needed food, they needed housing, um, they needed medicine. And that rings that's what UNRWA... <laughs> Indeed. Um, and actually, this is one of the leitmotifs that recurs throughout UNRWA's existence. So that's what UNRWA did in the initial months and year or so. But then it became apparent that the fledgling state of Israel was not going to abide by its obligations under Resolution 194 and to give the refugees the right of return. So suddenly, what everyone thought would be a temporary agency just handing out some food and some med medicine and some water and perhaps some tents just before these refugees went back to their homes in Israel, um, it morphed into something more permanent. So UNRWA had to start doing human development. These refugees had children who needed education. The refugees themselves needed health, as did their children. There were vulnerable people in the refugee population who needed relief and social services. And there in those three broad categories, you have what today are the core services of UNRWA, education for 550,000 children in Syria, Jordan, Lebanon, the West Bank and Gaza in over 700 schools across the Middle East. You have the uh, health department with something like 150 primary health clinics across the region and relief and social services. So emergency food for over 2 million people. Um, UNRWA's health department does 7 million patient visits a year, the vulnerable, the elderly, the sick, there are women's projects as well. So that, as I say, is UNRWA's core program, those three, education, health, relief and social services. But then, of course, because the Middle East has always been inherently unstable and because the refugees often find themselves in the fulcrum of this instability, look at Gaza today, UNRWA, while maintaining these core services suddenly has to get off get on and deal with 2.3 million people against whom a plausible genocide is being committed as we're seeing today in Gaza so there we have UNRWA in a nutshell on the one hand there are these core services on the other hand there's relief and social services now the other part of your question you asked was about the difference between UNRWA and UNHCR and, and before UNRWA you before you answer that just to clarify that UNRWA neither owns or administers the refugee camps correct and nor does it provide services only to refugees within camps no, that's absolutely right, because people often say, particularly the Israelis, that UNRWA is responsible for security, for Hamas in Gaza outside the camps or even inside the camps. The point is UNRWA runs services within refugee camps and UNRWA is responsible for its facilities, its schools, its warehouses, its food distribution centres, its primary health clinics and so on and so forth. But it's not responsible for what goes on 
outside and it can't be UNRWA is an aid organization it does not have it not doesn't have a private army or a police force that go, can go around policing um refugee camps um on this distinction between UNHCR and UNRWA UNRWA was established in 1949 by the general assembly UNHCR came into existence with the refugee convention in 1951 and essentially the difference is that UNRWA deals exclusively with Palestine refugees, those who were made homeless or forced from their homes by the 1948 war and their descendants, which is absolutely standard refugee practice with all refugee work, including UNHCRs. UNHCR deals with all the rest. So everyone else, all the other refugees in the world, apart from Palestinians, that falls under the mandate of UNHCR. There's one other very popular misconception, which the Israelis in particular put about, and that is that UNHCR does third, third country um, um, resettlement. So the idea is, you know, fold up UNRWA, hand all the refugees over to UNHCR, and they'll just resettle them outside Palestine. They'll hand them over, they'll go to Canada, and they'll go, I don't know, to Middle Eastern countries maybe. That isn't how it works, dear Israel far right. Um, you know, these are human beings with inalienable rights. And like all refugees, whether they're administered by UNHCR or by UNRWA, they have three potential choices to make. They can choose to stay where they are, local integration, as it's called. They can choose to go to a third country, third country resettlement, as I mentioned, you know, go to Canada, go to some country that has a, um, an asylum policy that will let you in, or the right of return. And interestingly, for UNHCR, the preferred remedy, as they call it, is the right of return. Why? Because in UNHCR's long history, it is very clear that the right of return produces the most stable outcomes. After a war, when refugees are driven across international borders or whatever, the result is much, much more stable. If after the war, in times of peace, those refugees go back home and they live alongside their neighbours in peace, they trade with their neighbours, they do business with their neighbours, who know, they may even intermarry with their neighbours, they may love their neighbours, who knows, but essentially it is a fallacy that UNRWA is pushing the right of return and UNHCR will resettle the refugees elsewhere. That is simply not true. Well, and another distinction is that apart from um, uh, general um, conformity to UN resolutions, UNRWA is neither empowered nor does it uh, propose any solution um, to, to Palestinian refugees, whereas UNHCR does propose specific solutions to those under its care. That is highly debatable and debated. Mm -hmm. And you will know the work of Lex Tackenberg and yes. Francesca Albanese. And in their huge tome on Palestine refugees and international law, they argue very strongly that although the Israelis in particular, but also the main donors like the Americans, have always forbidden UNRWA from engaging in discussions about durable solutions because they believe that UNRWA will just push the right of return, which isn't true. UNRWA will ask the refugees, like all refugees are asked, they have freedom of choice and they will make an informed decision. But it's not the case. And if you look at UNRWA's name, United Nations Relief and Works Agency, Works suggests a durable solution because from the very start, there were huge works programs, literally employment programs, which were created for the refugees in the countries where they were. So I understand what you're saying, Maureen, but believe me, it is a hotly disputed question, the question of whether UNRWA has the right or the mandate to push for durable solutions for the refugees. I mean, if you believe that UNRWA should protect all rights, then what about the right to self-determination? Is that not a legitimate right? And if so, how does UNRWA go about protecting that right to self-determination? You know, on goes the argument about whether UNRWA is mandated to engage in durable solutions. Right. Thanks for that clarification. Um, and, and now I'd like to turn to the current situation, um, specifically the recent Israeli allegations. Um, these are not the first against UNRWA, of course, and, is, and it has been suggested that these should be seen as part of a larger, not only Israeli, but US-Israeli campaign against the agency. Do you believe there is indeed such a campaign? And if you do, what in your view are its primary objectives? I do believe there's a campaign. I think it's pushed more by Israel 
than it is by the Americans, because the Americans, of course, are have been historically until very recently the largest funder by far of UNRWA. So there is and always has been a belief in Israel in Israeli political circles and military circles that UNRWA is pushing the right of return and that if you get rid of UNRWA, you magically get rid of the refugees and the right of return. But I mean, oh, UNRWA is a surrogate uh, for, the, yes, for the refugee that's the, question. That's the, that's, that's the thinking. But of course, that's a bit like saying that if you get rid of Oxfam, you get rid of poor people. I mean, it's just a, it's a sort of far right fascistic fantasy. It isn't actually based in refugee law or refugee best practice. Um, there has been this campaign as early as 1967, you got the the occupying power, the new occupying power complaining that the occupied people don't sufficiently accept the narrative in its textbooks, for example, of the occupying power of Israel. So as, as you suggest, Moeen, it's a very, very long narrative. And Israel has always argued that the Palestinians under UNRWA are taught violence, they're taught anti-Semitism, they're taught anti-Zionism. That actually isn't true. If you look at the textbooks, first of all, UNRWA teaches the textbooks of the hosts. So in Syria... Oh, it has multiple curricula. Yeah, so in Syria, it's preparing kids for Syrian public exams. Lo and behold, it teaches the Syrian textbooks. In Jordan, similarly, it's preparing kids for public exams in Jordan. And in Gaza and the West Bank, it's preparing kids for PA, for, for public exams, um, which are administered by the PA Education Ministry. And so it teaches textbooks, which the PA teaches. And if someone turned up in wherever you are, I believe Canada, if a UN agency turned up and started telling Canadian parents and Canadian schools what it should be teaching kids um, you know, in the classroom, I think Canadian politicians and human rights groups and parents, whatever, would very quickly object because education textbooks are a sovereignty issue. And, you know, the Israelis argue as if UNRWA could just change the textbooks, you know, do this, do that. It's not that simple. So, yes, the textbooks are very much the front line um, of the battle um, between Israel and UNRWA. But there are others. I mean, the Israelis regularly say that the staff social media postings show that there's a lack of neutrality. And there are other examples. Most recently, um, the claims, and they remain unsubstantiated claims, I might add, that 12 UNRWA staff members took part in the 7th of October attacks in southern Israel, um, that is just the latest salvo in a political smear campaign against UNRWA that really is as old as the occupation itself. But, but and... before we get to that, if, if I may interrupt, mm. uh, you did raise the issue of textbooks, mm. and these textbooks have, in fact, been repeatedly, I would say, incessantly investigated um, by the European Union, um, by EU states, um, by a whole host of agencies. What, what is, is there a general assessment of, of, of what these uh, multiple in-depth investigations have concluded? Yes, there is. And it's not just in-depth investigations. National Audit Office, like the GAO, the General Auditor's Office from the United States in 2019, I believe, just before I left UNRWA, um, they came and they did a root and branch audit of all of the neutrality questions in UNRWA, including the textbooks. And by and large, they gave UNRWA's textbooks a clean bill of health. And in fact, after that audit, they, the Americans carried on funding to the tune of $350 million. And believe me, if there was any doubt that UNRWA's textbooks or the PA textbooks, which UNRWA uses to be more accurate, was in any way promoting racism, anti-Semitism, violence against Jews, all of that kind of you know, allegation, believe you me, the Americans would not have, res have, have, been, funding, um, have been funding UNRWA. So yes, um, there have been audits. What UNRWA has tended to find is that there's a kind of echo chamber. So Israel has established various very pro-Israel think tanks or um, NGOs. I mean, good examples being UN Watch, NGO Monitor, Impact SC. I mean, Impact SC is a very interesting organization. They allegedly exist to make sure that curricula around the Middle East are in conformity with UN values, etc. But basically, they have made a habit of attacking UNRWA um, 
relatively recently, they did a big study of what they thought was UNRWA textbooks and launched this big attack, very public attack, only uh, it turned out to be Jordanian and Egyptian textbooks, and they'd got the wrong textbooks altogether. So they have very low um, credibility. Among and presumably the never examined the Israeli curriculum. Well, there's a very good question. I mean, the first thing every Israeli child is taught when he comes into school is that it is good to die for your country, which is the saying from an early Zionist, Mr. Trumpledore. And essentially, that is espousing political violence. And Israeli kids are taught that on day one in kin you know, when they turn up for their first year and um, their first class at school. So, yes, I mean, there isn't. Um, but the fact is that, you know, whatever is in textbooks anywhere in the world, the UN does have an obligation to teach children according to UN values and UNRWA certainly does that. It's got a very, very well-established um, process for reviewing PA textbooks. It does so according to three criteria, um, age-appropriate violence, um, gender representation to make sure that women and girls are properly represented in these books, and political neutrality. And when I was in UNRWA anyway, um, less than 4% of the materials which the education department in Amman examined were found to be problematic. And in my day, at least, what the education department used to do was produce alternative, what they used to call enrichment materials, teach them to teachers. And so when problematic passages in textbooks were about to be taught, the teachers would put them to one side and teach, you know, something which UNRWA's education department had specifically um, developed. So yes, yes the curriculum, Sorry, you said age-appropriate age violence. Did you mean something else? No, in other words, you're not going to teach seven-year-olds about, um, you I know, see. vicious yeah. terrorist acts or whatever. So age-appropriate, but what, what I mean by that is, you know, the books are examined to make sure that, you know, a nine-year-old doesn't have a textbook which depicts... Sabadam Shatila or whatever, yeah. Yeah, I mean, some, some yeah, I terrifying, yeah. some er terrifying act of violence. So it's age-appropriate violence... If that's no. not the right phrase, forgive me. I don't no, know now I get it. Yeah, you get it. Um, political neutrality and gender representation. Yeah. Yeah. But to, to answer your question that I was talking about before, yes, I mean the textbook issue is part of a much longer narrative. And actually, cutting to today, um, since the the, the 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 plausible genocide started in Gaza, um, several documents have come to light including an official Israeli document, which was leaked, which had a three-phase plan, the first uh, in relation to UNRWA. The first phase was um, to, um, to, to smear UNRWA's reputation, a smear campaign. Secondly, was a defund campaign. And the third was a dismantle campaign. So there were three clear phases set out in this officially... I don't know whether sanctioned or not, I don't think it was necessarily approved by the cabinet, but it was certainly reflective of Israeli thinking. So yes, it's a long narrative, it goes back to the occupation, and it stretches right to today, and we haven't talked about the allegations, but there has been no credible evidence produced well, by Israel to substantiate these latest claims against UNRWA staff members. So let's turn to those. And that would combine um, what you've just described as the smear campaign and the defund campaign. Um, remind us of, of, the, um, of the nature of the most recent allegations against UNRWA and its employees and how a number of the agency's main donors responded to these allegations. So Israel presented a list without any evidence of 12 staff members. Um, so names. Them, so names, yeah. And um, UNRWA was told that they were involved in the 7th of October attacks, but no actual evidence was handed over to UNRWA. And this came a day after the International Court of Justice on the 26th of January. Made no coincidence. Yeah, provisional rulings, and surprise, surprise, it appeared on the front page of the New York Times mm. that appeared not to check the story. Um, this is what I mean about these echo chambers. I mean, yes. the New York Times is not so much part of an echo chamber as a very large megaphone um, that has been trumpeting um, unchecked allegations, frankly. And this was a typical example. Now, what happened was the donors, I think, panicked. And David Cameron, the British Foreign Secretary, is on record as saying that he thought he thinks the British acted too hastily. And what happened was 16 donors 
defunded UNRWA, suspended funding, which effectively um, defunded UNRWA to the tune of $450 million. What percentage now, of its budget would that be? Well, the budget of UNRWA is an interesting, it's a sort of moving target. It's between 1.2 and 1.5 billion. So, so roughly a third. a third. Third yeah. to a half, yeah. So a large, large chunk of UNRWA's budget. Um, and what has happened is that the EU has seen the OIOS report. So in response to these allegations, these claims, um, the UN launched an internal investigation, independent of UNRWA, but internal to the UN, by the Office of Internal Oversight, alias OIOS. And a former French foreign minister um, has been commissioned to do a longer term report investigation into the neutrality frameworks that UNRWA has. Now, the Office of Internal Oversight has sent its interim report to the Secretary General. Um, and on the base of that interim report, the EU have resumed funding to the tune of 82 million euro. And the European Commissioner for Humanitarian Affairs, a Croat commissioner, a Croatian man, has gone on record, has said to a plenary in the parliament that he has seen they have been presented with no evidence whatsoever by the Israelis. And so it's just almost... to be clear, you, you mentioned earlier that UNRWA was not provided any evidence besides no. list of names. And you're now also saying that the donors who immediately responded by severing or suspending their funding to UNRWA also didn't receive more than names. Well, they received, some of them at least, the Americans, for example, did receive a dossier and Blinken, the American Secretary of State, at first said that they were cre that the dossier was credible. What else? But he, but, but, but he did also, in the same breath, say that they had not been able to do an independent verification. Mm -hmm. Go figure. It was credible, and yet they hadn't independently verified it. But then you had an American security, um, a part of the American security establishment, um, which has various categories for assessing these intelligence reports and the Israeli dossier was deemed to be of low probability. Low now, confidence, I think, is a term. Low, low, that's right. low, low, they had low confidence in it. That's right. So um, so it, it, it really does appear that the donors panicked. They acted very hastily. Um, and they've frankly been left with egg on their faces, as we say. The Israeli news management and the fake news tumbled out but that's now all coming home to roost because the donors here we are weeks on from these allegations and no evidence has been produced so you know i call this the mother of all lies i call this the dodgy dossier um because what's happened is that it's been it's underpinned this smear campaign this defund this dismantle campaign of the most far-right government in the history of the state of Israel. So it's most unfortunate that these donors have basically taken a decision which underpins this smear campaign, this attack on UNRWA, but perhaps most important, Moeen, it comes at a time when people are starving to death in Gaza on an industrial scale. So not only have the donors taken actions which help implement a far-right political attack, you know, um, politicizing humanitarian aid in a way which they're telling UNRWA, you know, it mustn't do and it's bad. Of course, politicizing humanitarian aid is always wrong, but that's what the donors have done. But it also violates the provisional measures of the ICJ, because on the 26th of January, the ICJ said that Israel, but no member state, could take any action that restricted humanitarian aid. And what did the donors do within a matter of 48 hours or so? Exactly that. They cut, they cut off funding to the one organization in Gaza that has the capacity with its 13,000 staff, its warehouses, its food distribution centers, its fleet of trucks to stave off starvation. So it, it, to say it's unfortunate is understatement of the century. Well, I would say it's, it makes the donors complicit in genocide and in in mass starvation. There's there's no other way of... of, of but, but, this, that one. but this raises another question. Um, we're talking here about states that have some of the most, um, let's say, professional intelligence services on the globe. 
that are keenly aware of Israel's agenda and its history of misinformation and distortion and its campaign against UNRWA. Yet, in response to basically a press report, they almost collectively took this decision. It's a very, it's a very difficult to accept that they were acting either in good faith or were panicked. Um, there seems to be something more sinister going on here. I mean, particularly as these are the very donors that had worked with UNRWA in partnership for decades on these neutrality issues. Mm -hmm. And the, you know, the drill had always been, if there are credible reports of neutrality violations, the donor, the Israelis, whoever it is, would bring this to UNRWA. It would be examined, it would be checked, it would be confirmed or not confirmed. And if guilt was established, then disciplinary action was always taken up to and including dismissal of the staff member. Now, I ask you, and I don't know the answer, why did the donors not do that in this case? There was a system, it was up and running, it had been developed over decades with these very donors. Why didn't they come forward and you know use the time-honoured process that they had? I don't know. And um, I'm not party to the political decisions. What I would say is I would like to turn the spotlight from UNRWA back onto these donors and say, what processes do you have in order to ring fence and make immune humanitarian decision making from politics? Because I think these questions should be kicked straight back at the donors following this absolutely disgraceful episode. And I think that, you know, one of the things that needs to come out of these investigations is not just, you know, what are the systems like within UNRWA, but what are the systems like in the donor community that allowed the most far right government in the history of Israel to have its agenda adopted by the donor community in a matter which is in a manner which is overtly punitive and which is restricting humanitarian aid in violation of the ICJ and in a manner which might well make them complicit, these donors complicit in mass starvation. These are very, very serious charges and they should be answered. And I think there should be accountability in the donor community for these appalling decisions. Well, you've, <clears throat> you've mentioned um, the relationship between um, the ICJ's uh, ruling on provisional measures on the one hand and the almost immediately um, succeeding suspension of funding to UNRWA. Um, I wonder whether there's also another aspect here, which is that in late 2023, the Security Council, apparently against the will of the UN um, Secretariat, adopted Resolution 2720, appointing a senior humanitarian and reconstruction coordinator for Gaza. And some have suggested that this is perhaps part of an agenda to replace and ultimately dismantle um, uh, UNRWA, at least within the Gaza Strip, by making this office responsible for, for humanitarian aid. Um, do you think there is a connection here, or are these two completely separate um, trajectories? I don't think there is any evidence for that. And I have worked very closely with Sigrid Karg, who's the official that you've just referenced, who was appointed as a result. And I can tell you, she is a woman of great integrity. And I don't think that she would allow herself to be used in this way. I think the purpose of this resolution, and by the way, we should talk about it because we're now seeing it with this maritime corridor from Cyprus into Gaza. I think that that resolution is a response to A, the fact that Israel was not allowing aid in and the Security Council had to do something. People were literally starving when that resolution was passed. And so I think it is a genuine attempt. It may be flawed in many ways, but I think the appointment of Sigrid is definitely um, all about making sure that humanitarian aid at scale gets into Gaza, however that can be done. So, you know, Sigrid Karg is very, very clear that opening up all the land routes 24-7 from Israel, from Jordan, the land corridor to, to Jordan, etc. Egypt, Israel, Egypt, uh, Jordan should be opened up 24-7. The airdrops, you know, whatever one thinks about them, they were in many ways an obscene photo op. On the other hand, it's a question of all hands on deck right now because Gaza is starving to death. And the same is true of the Sea Corridor. I, I know a bit about the Sea Corridor because 
I've, you know, I've, I've received briefings from various people on how this is happening. Um, within hours, and possibly even, you know, before this podcast goes to is is published, um, the first ship is going to arrive in northern Gaza with two hundred metric tons of canned food, of pulses, of flour, and of rice, and it will land um, on a. A, a, a pier that's been constructed by two groups that have actually been distributing aid through 60 plus aid uh, sort of food kitchens throughout the war. I mean, it's not a very well reported fact, but there have been groups empowering local communities, by the way, because there are there are hundreds of local volunteers in Gaza who have organized themselves and who have been distributing millions of ready made meals to people. And there's a huge maybe 300 thousand or so display internally a camp of internally displaced people in northern Gaza who have no food so this has been a lifeline and without this sea corridor believe you me more people would have starved so in the next few hours tomorrow Thursday sometime the first ship is expected to arrive that's about half a million ready meals there and then Which then need to be distributed it- which then need to be distributed, which which there is the infrastructure on the ground to distribute. Waiting in Larnaca, the port of Larnaca in Cyprus, um, are hundreds of tons more. So 500, there's a 500 ton shipment, which is 1 million ready meals, which if the first boat arrives and the distribution start, then another 1 million meals will be on the way. And if that is successful, more and more and more will come. Concurrent with this phase one, parallel with it, the Americans are going to be establishing a large floating pontoon I'm told that although ultimately that will take two months to finish, there is a plan to have a sort of interim arrangement in a matter of just a few weeks, which would allow the distributions to start, um, you know, really quite quickly. And that would be to the rest of the Gaza Strip. Now, logically, UNRWA is the agency that should be doing that. And Sigrid Karg has been very clear that she supports UNRWA. She has said on numerous occasions that UNRWA's work in this is essential it's inimical to um staving off starvation so if i could, any... if I could just on, on that i don't think um what's at issue here is is either sigrid gach's integrity or or intentions but rather a question about why this um mechanism was established and why those who promoted its establishment um uh thought that it was necessary to do so when you already have an agency like UNRWA, when you already have OCHA, when you already have the World Food Program, but you don't, um, you don't think that that there was an agenda here that may have been um, related to the campaign against UNRWA. I don't know, but I do know the operational realities on the ground, and the operational realities on the ground are that everyone had to get involved beyond UNRWA. So yes, there was a huge task. UNRWA has 1.2 million people on its food distribution lists in Gaza. Well, pretty much double that number are now needing food. So UNRWA is overwhelmed. I mean, Philippe Lazzarini, the UNRWA Commissioner General, has said many times that UNRWA is really on On the the brink. You know, on the brink. 160 plus of its staff have been killed. Its facilities have been bombed by the Israelis. There are hundreds of thousands of internally displaced people in UNRWA schools, in UNRWA clinics, in UNRWA vocational training centres, etc. UNRWA is completely overwhelmed. And more than 150 of its staff, and in many cases, along with their families, uh, killed during this. Yeah, uh... 160 plus, exactly. So, So more than UNRWA is needed. And someone needed to coordinate WFP, for example, um, bringing in food from Ashdod, the port in southern Israel, which UNRWA does, but other people need to do it. So I would say the operational realities on the ground very much dictated the need for someone to coordinate everything. And that is what Sigrid's job is. She is there to scale up aid and to make sure there is coordination. And by the way, I mean, a massive win a feather in the cap of her office an achievement for this a food corridor a a humanitarian aid lane 
across the eastern Mediterranean will be established. And by the way, Sigrid Karg is also, is also very clear that there has to be full land and all uh, uh, openings to Gaza functioning 24-7, including for commercial imports and exports. So, you know, it's not just about an aid pipeline being, you know, brought into existence. It's about trying to get the Gazan economy working as well. And that doesn't suggest some kind of plot by people who want to destroy Gaza, destroy UNRWA, destroy, you know, I think that it's a genuine attempt to deal with a really big problem, which is the determination of the state of Israel to violate international law, to violate the terms of the interim measures of the ICJ and to get as much aid into Gaza at a time when hundreds of thousands of people are going to starve to death. And I know when from you know your excellent public, your 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 um, interviews that you're not a great fan of airdrops. Neither am I. And when I saw kind of King Abdullah in a kind of Biggles, you know, flies alone kind of you know photo op, it sort of it made my stomach turn. But I did think when I saw pictures of people in Gaza scooping up flour from the floor, it broke my heart because it showed just how desperately needed those food airdrops were, even though some of them actually killed people, you know, which really makes them highly question questionable morally. But the fact is, every single point of entry into Gaza by sea, by the sky and by road must be fully open 24-7. And Sigrid Karg is very clear herself that all of these other methods, sea and air, in no way take the pressure off Israel to abide by its obligations as the occupying power and under international law. That is very, very clear. Well, that, that brings to a related question, which is the American initiative to um, build this pontoon um, uh, floating jetty, uh, whatever it is. And as you rightly point out, it will be an avenue um, for uh, delivering uh, increased humanitarian assistance to the Gaza Strip. But I think many people- And, are... and commercial exports, by the way. And room. commercial and exports. Commercial, which Sigurd was very, I mean, when she briefed the Security Council, she actually made that very clear. So it's not just a sort of aid pipeline. This is something which could be used to get the Gazan economy up and running. But many people look at it and say, why are the why are the Americans who effectively have absolute power over Israeli decision making? Um, do they? Do you really think that is true when you look at how Biden has struggled to contain his ally Benjamin Netanyahu and reports now that he invites Benny Gantz to Washington precisely to dethrone him? That suggests a pretty dysfunctional relationship. It does not suggest um, a relationship between a superpower which has any influence whatsoever on its client state well, in the Middle East. Well, let's let's agree perhaps that the US has chosen not to exercise its influence as opposed to not having influence. But be that as it may, um, many people would argue that the US could and should have used its influence with Israel to simply get all these the land. loaded trucks waiting to enter um, uh, the Gaza Strip, giving them permission to deliver the aid instead of, you know, go doing this roundabout months long process of delivering much less aid uh, by sea. I, I, I agree with that, Moin, but what are you going to do? Let people starve to death while these political issues play out? Well, they, they would starve to death um, if the U.S. Uh, chooses not to use its leverage and influence. They are, they are starving to death. So at least 24 children have starved to yes. death in our Shiva hospital in the last yes. week. Yes, and of course so they not, would still be a, alive. A, Sorry. Yeah, they would still be alive. They would still be alive if America had used its influence over Israel successfully and Israel, but they weren't going to. They weren't going to that. I mean, whether the Israelis, you know, the Israelis clearly weren't going to and whether you think it's because the Americans didn't or choose not to or whatever, they it, it hasn't happened. And people are now, star now starving in Gaza. And by the way, food is beginning. Hopefully food with this across this land, this maritime corridor will start arriving in the next 24 hours. And what the date is it today? I mean, 24 hours from whenever we're talking. Yes. Uh, so Thursday, the 14th of March. Yeah. 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 I'd now like to turn back to um, UNRWA and ask you about criticisms that have been lev leveled at the agency, and for that matter, also um, the senior leadership of, of the United Nations in New York. Um, 
including by former employees, uh, basically saying that their panicked response to the Israeli allegations, which is which as you um, previously noted, were presented without evidence or substantiation, um, uh, their panicked response and jettisoning, jettisoning of due process towards employees of, of UNRWA who were accused um, did two things. On the one hand, it unnecessarily lent credence to Israel's allegations. And on the other, it served to legitimize um, the punitive measures undertaken by UNRWA's largest uh, funders. Others have also criticized UNRWA's lackluster communications policy in response to this crisis. Some have pointed out, um, you know, Chris Gunna seems to be a much more effective um, defender of, of, of UNRWA um, than its uh, senior leadership, even though he's no longer working with the uh, agency. How do you respond to these criticisms? Well, there are two parts. So there's the action of the Commissioner General in separating these 12 people from the agency. And then you've asked an additional question about UNRWA's communications policies um, and practices. Um, on the first of those, um, I am not going to come on this podcast and attack the Commissioner General because there's nothing the Israelis and the enemies of of UNRWA, particularly those in the, the Israeli far right, will want more than me t turning on Philippe Lazzarini. He took that decision firmly believing that he would head off a crisis if he took firm, robust and swift action. And that's precisely what he did. He thought that by doing this, he would allay the fears of the donors that robust action had been taken under a policy which, as I said earlier, has been developed in partnership with the donors. And I think it took everybody by surprise, I'm sure including you, Moeen, that the donors suddenly, um, you know, departed from UNRWA to the tune of $450 million. So it was done to protect the interests of the agency. It was done very much in accordance with um, policies which are permitted under the frameworks that the UNRWA has. And, you know, it, it did lead to this mass exodus of donors, but that clearly was not the desired effect. And that was clearly not what the Commissioner General had in mind. He thought he was protecting the agency. By and demonstrating that, seriousness of purpose towards the donors. Yeah. I mean, it, I think the donors betrayed UNRWA. I think if you're going to point a finger at anybody, point the finger at the donors, because the donors and UNRWA had, I saw it from the inside. I saw these frameworks and these practices being developed over years and years and years. As you quite rightly said, these allegations are not new. UNRWA has been around this course before. And I think it was perfectly reasonable of Commissioner General Lazzarini to expect the donors not to overreact as they did. And indeed, hey, Lord Cameron, the British Foreign Secretary, has on the record as saying the donors acted too hastily. And I think that really does you know, that gives some support to the action which Philippe Lazzarini took. On the question of um, of, of communications policy, look, I have, to, I have to say, it's really tough from within UNRWA having to defend the agency because you have to speak from within accepted UN style guides and, you know, principles and security council resolutions and also mindful of what the donor dynamics are. So, I mean, when I was in UNRWA, I used to sail pretty close to the wind by criticizing Israel, accusing Israel of war crimes. And I would regularly get my knuckles, you know, wrapped um, by the Americans. Um, actually, most <laughs> a lot of the criticism I faced was internally, you know, the UN's political office, the guys at UNSCO, um, they would regularly um, stab, you know, stab me in the back for things I was saying. I think I, you know, I've got as much criticism um, from inside, you know, the political yes. side of the UN than I did from, from, from the Americans or um, the Israelis. But again, I will not attack um, UNRWA's spokespeople. I, I think, you know, they have a massive international pro-Israel, pro-Zionist, Hasbro machinery, massively funded, hugely well-resourced. You know, they have tentacles everywhere. And the idea that a relatively small, under-resourced communications team in UNRWA 
um, can somehow take on this massive Zionist juggernaut that's putting out lies and disinformation all the time. Um, I think it's a very unequal struggle. To, you know, it's a very asymmetric conflict. And so, I, I mean, forgive me, but I won't criticize UNRWA. No, nor, nor, nor is nor is a purpose to um, yeah. And by the way, Marie, I, mean, I, I have I have stepped in to defend UNRWA. Um, because I care about the refugees, I care about Gaza, and I think the things that I've been saying needed to be said, and I fully recognise that it's really tough for people inside UNRWA to say these things, because quite frankly, that would lead to donor defunding, you know. If, well, can, if I ask, can I ask, pose a question differently? Do you feel the senior leadership of the UN in New York has been sufficiently supportive of the agency during this arguably unprecedented crisis in the agency's history? No, I do not. And I'm very clear about this. I think that the Secretary General was too quick to assume the guilty narrative. I think that much more could have been done to stand by UNRWA. I think much more could have been done earlier on to face down the false information that was put about by Israel. I said immediately that if Israel actually had real evidence as opposed to unsubstantiated claims, it would, would be on the front. Yeah. We'd all have seen it. Guess what, folks? They don't have it. That's why we've not seen it. It was so obvious to me. I mean, I was the subject of lies, fake news, misinformation put out by Mark Regev and all of his cohorts. You know, during the 2014 conflict, um, when the Israelis were hitting UNRWA schools and killing people, um, Mark Regev would tell journalists, oh, there were militants in the schools. And journalists would phone me up and say, oh, Mark Regev just told us there were militants in your schools. Of course, in the fog of war, with confusion going on, UNRWA wasn't able to interview staff, to look at you know all the evidence that was available and make a proper determination. It was only after the 2014 conflict that there was a board of inquiry, a so-called BOI, when we were able to establish the extent to which Mark Regev and co were telling lies. It was baseless. But of course, as ever with these stories, people remember the original allegation, as they have here, um, but they're less likely to remember the refuting and the rebuttal of um, the allegations. So, yeah, I mean, it's a very unequal struggle. And I think the UNRWA communications team have performed valiantly. Um, you know, every single news agency in a multiplicity of languages across the world are phoning them up 24-7. So I would I would stand by them and say they've done an utterly valiant job. Okay. Um you have at the same time recently proposed a 10 point plan for the agency's rescue and uh, revival. Without getting into too much detail, um, why did you feel the need to formulate this plan and, and what are its main elements? I felt the need to do it because it just seemed so obvious that it had to be done. And I, I got the sense from talking to people in UNRWA that there were loads of donor briefings and, and all sorts of briefings for all sorts of stakeholders in UNRWA going on. But I felt that just something clear and simple and very strategic might prompt people in the right direction. And it's a very simple concept. I mean, when the defunding happened, um, there were some donors who did not abandon UNRWA, Norway, Spain, Ireland and Belgium. And they put out very strong arguments um, for why it was a mistake to defund UNRWA, particularly now. And so the point of this plan was simply to work for UNRWA to work, management to work with these donors who'd been good donors um, and to get them to do the heavy lifting on bringing back the other donors. And I think to some extent that has, that has actually happened. And as I speak, the EU have come back, the Swedes have come back, um, and the Canadians have come back. And I'm hopeful that the Brits will come back quite soon. Um, Andrew Mitchell, the development minister, and David Cameron, the foreign secretary, have made it quite clear that they intend to come back. And I think others like Australia, Penny Wong, the foreign minister, is pretty much on record as saying that they've not seen any evidence um, to back up this Australian decision. So I think we can expect, I mean, one of the biggies is Germany. So Germany um, funds UNRWA to the tune of 200 million euros. It's the second um, largest donor after yeah. the United States. Yeah. yeah, exactly, exactly. So, but of course, very, very close to Israel, um, all that Holocaust guilt, 
um, means that, um, you know, Germany will tow Israel's line. But interestingly, you know, the IDF, the Israeli army, are beginning to realize that if UNRWA doesn't do all these food distributions, then maybe the occupying power will have to do, especially an occupying power that's just obliterated most of Gaza and all the infrastructure that you would need, you know, things like roads, um, you know, distribution centers, all those sorts of things that you need to distribute food at scale have been destroyed by the IDF. And if UNRWA doesn't do it, you know, guys, maybe the IDF should be forced to abide by its obligations under the Fourth Geneva Convention and do it. So I think even Israel is beginning to regret this decision by the fascistic far right in Israel to destroy UNRWA. Although um, you say fascistic far right, but as you've pointed out, this has been effectively an agenda item um, for every Israeli government for decades. I don't think that they are going to have ever gone as far as threatening to withhold visas for UNRWA yes. staff. And, um, and, and if you could for a moment just explain um, or what are the new measures the, that, that we haven't seen before? Well, I mean, withholding um, visas for UNRWA staff is one way that the Israelis have. I mean, if people can't get across the Allenby Bridge from Jordan into, into Israel, the occupied territory, then they can't. Um, and it's very difficult to mount a huge aid operation. Similarly, international staff arriving in Ben Gurion Airport, if they're not allowed in, they can't get to their offices. And um, this is a matter of policy now. I'm not saying it's a matter of policy, but it's been threatened. I mean, if you look at the media, I mean, I have no particular connection with the Israeli administration, but I, I see what I, you know, I read in Haaretz and other newspapers. Um, then there's the question of bank accounts. So a lot of Israel, of UNRWA's, um, financial relationships with its contractors, you know, buying huge amounts of aid and all sorts of medicines, things that they have to, UNRWA has to distribute, that comes through Israeli banks. And if the government in Israel forbids UNRWA to have bank accounts, then, you know, that stops. Um, similarly, um, leasing of property. Um, so there have been threats to cancel the leasehold arrangements of, for example, UNRWA's main headquarters in East Jerusalem, which is also, incidentally, the headquarters of the West Bank operation. So, you know, that those are the sorts of punitive bureaucratic measures which Israel is threatening to take. Now, of course, the big question is, will the donors to UNRWA allow that? I mean, if donors are giving hundreds of millions of dollars to make UNRWA operational, um, in order to do what its client state, the Israeli government should be doing under the Fourth Geneva Convention, it's most unlikely that it will allow a bunch of petty far-right politicians to undermine that by refusing to rubber stamp a visa in some department of the Home Ministry, I, I, I suggest. But I don't know, you know, and nor does UNRWA. So it's something which the Americans probably need to start straightening out. And that will be another one of those things which we've alluded to in this conversation, I mean, um, that will test the strength of American power um, to make Israel do the right thing. And in the meantime, um, UNRWA's ability to function and deliver its essential services effectively um, hangs in the balance. It, it does. It does hang in the balance. And this is a political question. It's a financial question. But both of those have practical implications. So politically, there is a battle going on for the existential future of UNRWA. Don't forget that UNRWA also works in Syria, Lebanon and Jordan. So it's very much a fight for the existential future of UNRWA in the West Bank and Gaza. Though if donors defund to the extent they have done, then clearly the operations in these other places will be affected. Um, it's a financial, as I say, um, question, because without the money, UNRWA won't be able to pay its staff. About 90 percent of UNRWA's budget is paying staff. So, you know, once you start not being able to pay staff, then your operations really do start to crumble. Um, and very lastly, it's an operational thing. You know, it's a battle. One of the battle lines, as I've been explaining, is, is all about having boots on the ground, you know, teachers in the schools, doctors in the clinics, um, workers in the food distribution centres. And without that, um, it would be very difficult for UNRWA to function. Chris Gunness, thank you very much for sharing your insights, your experiences, and your expertise with Connections. It's been a fascinating discussion. It's a real pleasure. It's a great pleasure to talk to someone who I respect so much. So thank you very much for having me it's on your program. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Brilliant.